It's been a month now since Sam died, and I've been wandering around our fields a lot since then. We are so lucky to have this land, and our house and our garden. It's all safe and calm, and a good place to be while I chew things over. I was rather hoping the sky would fall down, and they wouldn't have to go through all this again. But the world doesn't work like that. Instead, there's a hole in me now where he should be. Sometimes it feels like Sam's missed the school bus home. And I'm looking out the back window and I see him standing in the road. And I'm shouting out, stop the bus. He's just a little boy and he's left behind on his own. But the bus doesn't stop. And there's nothing I can do. And the whole world's that bus and it's hurtling on through space at thousands of miles an hour without him. And it's hard. It's already been a month and we've already travelled millions of miles without him. I'm also thinking about Sam's brother Ty who died many years ago and I'm trying hard to remember the things I learned after that happened because I have learned a few things over these long years and I'll try to share them here in case they help you too. Because of course, our family's grief is hardly unique. There's a lot of it around and if you haven't lost a loved one yet, then go and hug them quick while you can. I wish I could go back and explain a few simple things to the young man I was then. Things that would have helped so much and possibly avoided the disasters that followed. When Ty died, following a miserable little car crash, he was five years old. Completely lovable and completely loved. The middle one of three gorgeous little boys. And it was very hard to lose him. It hurt so much I really thought I would break. And in some ways I did break, I suppose. It was too much for me and my marriage and within two years I was living in the back of a car. I'd lost Ty and my family and my home and my garden and my workshop and my mental health. And I was in serious danger of losing my other two children and my life. And it was a desperately lonely and sad time. I'd wandered into the hole to try to find out how big it was. But there was no end to it. And by the time I'd realised that, it was a long, long way back out again. And looking back now, I understand much more about what happened to me. Apart from the huge sadness involved, a big part of my reaction back then was shock. In fact, six months after it happened, I was still walking around with a stoop. And when the doctor saw me, he said, I think you're still in shock, Tim. And he was probably right. Unfortunately, he then put me on antidepressants. And that was when things really went wrong. I wasn't depressed. I was grieving. That's all. Anyway, since that time, in all the years spent climbing out of the hole of rebuilding my life piece by piece, with Sandra joining me along the way, I have realised that the answers to all my questions weren't in the hole at all. They were all around me, in this garden, in the trees and the fields and the hedges. This ash tree, for instance, produces hundreds of thousands of seeds every year, as does this sycamore. And almost all of those seeds get eaten by mice, birds, fungus, slugs, insects, whatever. Perhaps a few saplings will survive a year or two, but most of those will get eaten by the horses or the rabbits. Perhaps just one young tree will survive to maturity in the lifetime of its parent. And those rabbits will have babies. Adorable baby rabbits that hop about on our lawn. But out of the seven or eight babies born, how many will survive the fox and the stoat and the diseases and still be here next year? Probably none. And the same thing happens to the swallow babies and the robins and the ladybirds and the earthworms and the nettles and the grasses and the sheep and the honeybees. 
most of them die long before they are adults. In fact, every single species on our land produces more babies than are needed to replace the parents and continue the line. And most of those babies just won't make it. They die. The frogs in the pond, the blackbirds in the hedge, the apples in the tree, the beetles in the ground, they're all the same. And it's not only this garden or these fields, of course, it's across the whole world. It's every single species that lives on this planet. They all produce more babies than are needed and most of those babies die. And we know why that happens, of course, because if all the acorns survived, there would be nothing but oak trees. And if all the frogs survived, we'd be knee deep in them in no time. We recognize this is necessary in the natural world. This savage struggle that keeps populations stable and landscapes diverse, it's essential. But it is only achieved at the cost of billions and billions and billions of young lives every year. And we're just the same. We're just another species living on the planet and the same rules apply to us. They really do. I know that temporarily we live in a time and a place when most human babies don't die anymore, but it really is a temporary phenomenon. And of course, that has led to a huge increase in the human population in recent years. In fact, we've doubled in number since 1970, and that has led to all sorts of problems, as you know. In any other species, we'd call it a plague, but that's a whole other subject that I won't get into just now. But we can be sure, one way or another, it won't last. It can't last because it's unsustainable and the population will come back into balance sooner or later. But the main point is that it is completely natural and normal for babies and children to die. It really is. Of course, that doesn't stop it being immensely painful and distressing for those of us left behind. But if I had known this when my first son died, it would have helped me immensely. I would have understood what was happening. I'm sure it wouldn't have hurt any less, but at least I wouldn't have been so shocked and disbelieving and uncomprehending. Instead, I've been brought up in a religious household, in a religious country, with all the bizarre stories and teachings that go with that. Essentially, I was taught that humans are different from the rest of the natural world. Not just different, but better, that different rules applied to us. Now, no wonder I was shocked to the core when I found out that just isn't true. Perhaps the idea of a heaven and ghosts and spirits and things is of comfort to you and that's fine. But I prefer to recognize that we are just not that important. We are just another part of this wonderful, tragic, sad, magnificent natural world and perhaps it would help if we could teach our children that too. Which brings me back to sitting in the garden thinking about my own boys and I get great comfort from this place and now more than ever I feel I'm a part of it. I'm not an outsider or a visitor, I am a part of this garden just another species living here. And I can relate to the rabbit parents and the grasses and the butterflies because, just like them, I too had beautiful, perfect children. And just like them, some of my children were cut down before their time. And just like them, I am scarred by my experiences. Such is the world, these are the rules. Yes, it's terrible, but it's all perfect too. These flowers are perfect. They don't live very long, but aren't we glad to have them while they last? Isn't the garden better for them being here? And then they're gone. It's all right. 
I am so lucky to have had three lovely children, and two are gone now, and it's all right. And I still have my lovely son, Neil. How lucky I am. Oh, it, it's terrible, but it's all perfect, too. If you're grieving a little boy or a little girl, or someone else who you miss a lot, go and sit in the woods and the fields. Or come and sit with me in this garden. It won't stop you hurting. Grieving is like getting beaten up every day. You sort of get used to it. But if you curl up under a hedge and listen to the breeze through the grasses and watch the insects, you might remember how it all works. All those little noises. Everything's so busy living before it dies, just like your child was. And then, after a while, get up again and hug those you love while you can and get on with life. And you and I will always be sad about the ones who died. And that's just the price we pay for loving someone. But we can also be happy again too. One day, probably. Those emotions are not mutually exclusive. We can be happy and sad at the same time. I've done it for years. <sighs> Look after yourself and wear your scars with pride. We're all part of the garden now. And it's all terrible. And it's all perfect. And that's all right. <laughs>